Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Future Plymouth 2030, episode nine. And this week's topic is behaviour change psychology. Uh, we have three guests with us this afternoon. Uh, first off, Elizabeth Cavagnard, who's a senior people and change consultant at PS, uh, PCSG. Uh, she's going to talk us through the strategies and examples of behaviour change and how this could be applied to the, uh, decarbonising our planet. Then, then next we have Jackie Young from Environment Plymouth, and she's also representing Devon and, uh, Devon and Plymouth Chamber, and she'll explain how local business community is responding to the climate emergency. And finally, we have Dr. Rory Jones, who will present some of the outcomes of a series of recent research projects at the University of Plymouth, investigating the potential for carbon and energy reduction by changing occupant behavior in buildings. So another, yet again, another really good lineup. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as usual, we'll be having a Q&A session at the end. So please uh, get your questions in throughout the, throughout the program by clicking the Q&A button. Or if you're brave, you can ask your question direct by raising your hand by clicking the raise hand button uh, at the end. So first up, I'll hand you over to Elizabeth Camagna, who will talk through her presentation. Over to you, Elizabeth. Good afternoon all. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak. And my talk is regarding decarbonisation and behaviour change. So just to introduce myself properly, I was actually born in Plymouth, so like many of you, I could consider myself at least partly Jana. Now, I'm raised in Somerset and I'm a People and Change Consultant with P PCSG. Uh, my role there is to support programmes teams and individuals seeking to transform themselves and their behaviour. So I'm a coach. I have a passion for collaboration and particularly how this can impact socially. So what I'd like to look at today is how we can change our behaviour in a way that contributes to decarbonisation and climate change. I wanted to start by reflecting on a North American Indian belief, which is that we belong to the earth, whereas in the UK, we seem to believe that the earth belongs to us. I noticed that when we talk about climate change, we talk about planet earth suffering. But actually for me, planet earth is of us and we are of it. So if planet earth is suffering, we suffer too. And this is why it's entirely motivating to think about what we can do to contribute to climate change. Some of the things that we've been noticing and really seeing- Sorry to interrupt you, Elizabeth, sorry. Yeah. Um, I don't think you're sharing your screen. Sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry, I'm not sharing my screen. Is that what you said? Yes, yeah. So you can't see those slides. Let me just stop then. That's better, thank you, Elizabeth. Yep, you can see those slides, okay? Super, okay, thank you for flagging, Roy. So these unprecedented storms have essentially become quite commonplace. And that means that we are facing issues like increased frequency and severity of disease outbreaks. And never has that been more pertinent than right now as we look to come out of the global coronavirus pandemic and the restrictions that we face in the UK. The natural impact of these, these unprecedented storms is increased competition, food, water, and other resources such as habitable land. And that leads us into difficulties like large scale human migration. One of the biggest changes I've seen in my lifetime is this tendency for large scale human migrations. So the, the scale of this change is, is really quite epic. And the amount of displaced people that we have throughout the world is significant. So for example, in 2017, 68 and a half million people were forcibly displaced. And a third of these were forced to move by sudden onset weather events. 
And that's a scale worth just taking a moment to reflect on. From this diagram done by the United Nations, you can see these green zones, which is where people are migrating towards, and the pink and the red zones, which is where people are migrating from. And you can see a sort of a general trend emerging there. And when the UK is seeing increased levels of migration. So these are the sorts of things that are facing us. Now, we have a definition of the term refugee, that is to say someone fleeing conflict, violence, persecution. There's a new term being discussed, climate migrants, meaning fleeing the effects of climate change. And it's not a legally defined term as it stands, but it, but it could be. It's something that's in conversation right now. The importance of the mass migration that we're seeing is really thinking about humans and our ways of understanding the world. We really find it hard to connect longer term consequences such as mass migrations with our actions today, right now, this week. But in order to do that, I just wanted to reflect on the numbers of the UK population. So feel free to type into the comments bar if that's available to you. And remember, what is the current UK population? Because it's about 69 million. So the level of mass migration we saw in 2017, and it's much higher now in 2021, is the same as the UK population being on the move. And that's so significant, it becomes difficult for us to comprehend. And what we realise from dealing with disaster emergencies is that actually human beings suffer with compassion fatigue. So people who are fundraising to deal with the effects of tornadoes and the effects of these sudden onset weather events recognise that we can't keep giving and can't keep being compassionate. We run out of energy as human beings. I just wanted to recognise what the scale of this, this climate change means for us and means for us emotionally. So I'd just really appreciate it if you could take a moment to reflect on what does climate change anxiety, what does that phrase mean to you? And I'd just like to see a few of those comments come up in the comments box. I'm just gonna give you a couple of minutes just to reflect on what, what does climate change anxiety mean to you? What does it bring up in you? Thank you for your comments, it's really good. So worry, impact, helplessness, competition. Paralysis. A feeling of proactivity. And thinking about our own and other people's futures. And there's this feeling of, I don't know what to do. Thank you, that's really, really helpful. Thank you for your comments, that's amazing. Please feel free to, to keep commenting as we go through this session. These feelings are, are kind of unsettling feelings, is what I notice. So this climate change anxiety creates a worry in us. And for one or two of us, it might create motivation or proactivity. But for the majority of comments in that comments box, it's creating in us a feeling of helplessness. I don't know what to do. It's an uncertainty that it creates in us. So I'd just like to take a moment to, to just notice that. So the effect of climate change on us emotionally is uncertainty and helplessness. Okay. Some of what makes us feel sort of more helpless is about 
making sure that the impacts that climate change are having feel perceptible so we can understand what's happening around us because we learn by what we see and Dawlish train line collapsing several years ago as a result of a big storm is a good example of something that comes onto our doorstep, comes onto our radar and starts to really catalyze some thinking about what, what can we do. It brings about that sense of more of an urgency. It's more relatable. So the migration crisis, whilst it is absolutely massive and something we need to, as, as a world, give thought to, might not necessarily feel like something you and I can impact. When something feels closer to us, like the Dawlish train line, it may feel like something we wish to take, um, wish to take a stand on, take an interest in, take some action on. And this phrase, climate emergency, I don't know what that creates in you emotionally, but for me, that's a sense of panic and urgency. And with an emergency, usually we have a concept of what to do because there's a drill. We might even have practiced this drill through schools, through our organisations. And emergencies tend to be quite situation specific. We've got a specific threat to respond to, like a fire drill, gas masks for bomb threats, a hurricane drill or a virus control. They're quite situation specific, but with something as big and complex as climate change, it feels like we know there's trouble ahead, but what am I to do? Face the music and dance? And the difficulty about the feeling that this creates in us is that we're geared to turn away from fear and towards something that feels comfortable. So what can readily happen in us is moments after we feel this fear, we turn away from it and we do something that feels comfortable. The real threat is that actually the emotions generated by the climate crisis is an extreme emotional response and that harms our ability to make decisions. But there is something we can do to deal with that. And that's exactly what you've just done in the comments box with me here. It's to have dialogue. And there's such a thing as a carbon conversation. You can find out more on the BBC website. And that's about engaging with people emotionally in order to generate a change in habits. So instead of having a stark emotional reaction and then passivity setting in, actually by doing things together as communities, we enable action. The thing that happens when we share our feelings is we take the power away we share our common humanity and we catalyze ourselves and others into action. And when we're thinking about behavior, there are several things that affect our behavior. And the first of those would be the situation as I see it. So literally what I see happening around me. So my local context, what I experience day to day. I'm also markedly affected by what I see other people doing about this. And what that means is, when I see someone exhibiting good recycling behaviours, when I see someone using um, a water bottle that's, that's multiple use, all of those things start to reinforce in me new behaviours. Another factor is my role, what I consider to be my remit. So I may feel that I have influence within my family, within my organisation to make some changes, to be part of a change. And if I feel that's part of my remit, then I'm more likely to be able to take action. And culture, we talk a lot about culture, don't we? If we just look at culture as being what is okay. So an example of this would be Glastonbury Festival said, actually no single use water bottles will be allowed at Glastonbury Festival when it did occur. And that quickly made disposable water bottles quite unfashionable. And it brought about a trend in, in using alternatives. So the culture, what we see happening around us, what is acceptable, what is cool, what is OK, is regularly is shifting continually. And so we all of us strive to keep up with that. The other thing that affects our behaviour is how I see myself. So if I see myself as a responsible citizen, as an active person, as a proactive person, that will help guide my behaviour. 
I don't know if any of you are Faithless fans, but I am. And in composing this talk, I was on a run and a song came on that had lyrics that really resounded with me. How can I change the world if I can't even change myself? How can I change the way I am? And I thought, great questions, not just great lyrics. So I've got a couple of tools that I wanted to share today to help us think about how can I act? And one of these is about this circle of concern, the circle of control. And the circle of concern are all those things that affect me. They could be the news, natural disasters, the weather, when we're talking, we worry about that. But what we notice about everything that's in the circle of concern is that I can't control it. It affects me, but I can't control it. And then there's this circle of control, which is oftentimes smaller. It's the things that I can control. And what we're saying with this model is that actually, if you look on the left hand side there, we have the reactive. When we're feeling reactive, actually, the things that are concerning us are taking our energy. We're worrying about them. We may not be acting on them. And that's being reactive. Being proactive is about being conscious of and clear of where I personally, where my organisation can affect change. And what we're trying to do when we're being proactive is to focus our minds and our energy on what can I do, providing momentum for ourselves and others. So we're trying to fend off the feeling that this anxiety creates in us of helplessness. When we focus on what we can do, that can help us to move forwards. I don't know if you have seen a model before now that differentiates between your thoughts, your feelings and your behaviours. I've tried to draw out for you this feeling of hopelessness and where that comes from. And feel free to use this kind of model just to break down the thoughts I'm having, the feelings that evokes in me and then what it results in me doing. Now, this is a downward spiral. This is when it's not going so well. And it's also the thoughts that I have. Okay, so that if my thought is, I can't make a difference to this, it's too big a problem, I can't make an impact, then the feeling that evokes in me is hopelessness and apathy. And what I find myself doing is doom scrolling, looking through social media for messages which support my feelings of doom. Watching the news cycle obsessively to notice those things that back up my belief that I can't make a difference. But that's when I'm in a negative cycle. And the best news possible is that as soon as I'm aware of this, I can interrupt it. I can interrupt my own thinking. I can interrupt and change my own behaviour. So how I can make a difference to myself is to notice that thought and, and interrupt it and come into thinking, what else could it be? Well, maybe it's that this feeling of uncertainty is I don't know how to make a difference. I just don't know. But what could I do? What's the sense of possibility that I have? And that creates in me a feeling of curiosity. That helps me to engage with things like checking my carbon footprint, changing my travel plans, deciding to eat less meat, or actually eating less meat. So the, th the thoughts and the feelings are related and they affect how I behave. And we do need to understand our underlying, and this is why I asked you about your feelings. Thank you for sharing openly. So the, the moment that I had a realisation was, well, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. I still do. But today I'm wise, so I'm changing myself. That is to say, whenever I find myself concerning about the world as a whole, I try to focus on what can I do to change myself? Even better news is if 2020 has taught us things, it's that we can take on new habits. And when the times call for it, we can take on quite a lot. We've taken on mask wearing and hand sanitizing, staying indoors a lot, reviewing guidelines on government announcements, and also cycling and walking. So 
our behaviours, my behaviours have changed during 2020. So that teaches me, that teaches us hopefully, that we can adopt new habits. I wanted to give you a couple of, of case studies of some change just to give you an idea and hopefully this will evoke a feeling in you that maybe there are things we can do. So my firm PCSG is a small medium enterprise, UK and Australia based, and we're a consulting firm, digital consulting firm. And we work with clients all over the country and that means historically we've travelled a tremendous amount. Now we are carbon neutral and what that means is we went through a very careful and deliberate phase of measuring our carbon. And we used this conversion uh, tool on the slide there. And what we did with that was having calculated our carbon cost, you can tell your impact. And that's really, really helpful. So measuring is a, is a helpful tool in helping us to set off on a journey. And in 2019, we emitted 38 and a half tonnes of carbon through the travel that we did, and that reduced to 8.4 tonnes in 2020. Now, that was in a lockdown period, completely recognised that the carbon footprint of all of us would have changed in that period. However, by noticing that, we can now see, seek to capitalise on those gains and keep that going as we come out of these restrictive measures. And we can also seek to reduce things like our food waste. So we exist and um, we live in a, a work in a, a shared office but we've convinced this shared office to get a contractor to recycle our food waste and we've increased our food waste recycling the ways of making these changes are to, to continue to measure so looking at our personal footprints and there's a couple of tools illustrated there that you can use wwf one of them and what that means is that you can be clear on your impact and then target your impact. The first step would be uh, my advice on behaviour change. So taking the first step is the key thing. So I'm trying to take up running, putting your trainers on is the key thing that gets you to running. And it's no different with behaviour change and climate. Taking the first step is key. So my husband and I decided we wanted to eat one meat-free meal per week. And having started that, made it easier to keep doing it because we had a meal in the freezer. And now we're up to sort of two or three meals a week. So the idea of taking the first step is that it gives you momentum to carry on. It gives you increased confidence in what you're doing. Equally, you can drop cling film and use Tupperware. We're trying to do without cling film this year. So those things will spiral into a personal commitment to replace any products in the house with the plastic free options. Another tip for behavior change is attach an existing habit. Uh, use an existing habit and attach a new habit. So we take out our recycling waste to put outside in the recycling bins. Well, what we've done is we've had our inside the compost bin, we've got the yeah, external compost bin right next to it so that we remind ourselves to do the, the food composting as well. Another is to notice a habit that you've tried that's worked. For example, virtual meetings such as this. So my commitment is to coming out of this crisis, think about can we use virtual meetings as default? Do we need to travel? And I want to thank Peter Badger, who I believe is on the call, for this next bit of inspiration. This is his case study in his carbon footprint. And I realised that Peter in 2020 measured his carbon footprint and that was 98%. And he did that on the WWF site. Recently, following my request, um, Peter updated his footprint and let me know, actually I have reduced that to 94%. And that's even bearing in mind, imagining there isn't a pandemic on. So he was honest about his behaviours as if we weren't in a pandemic. But by doing this, that seemed to have strengthened the resolve to keep going because Peter's noticing his own progress. So what he's doing here is he's using his foldable bike, he's cycling more, um, variety of measures, but he's working towards an ultimate commitment of relinquishing his car. But by doing this gradually, he's making sure that he's, this behaviour change is sustainable. And that's a really smart way forward. So 
Thank you so much, Peter, for sharing your experiences and well done on reducing your carbon footprint. And another way that we can make a difference, which feels quite small and quite manageable, is the next time we place our food order, just to consider what we're maybe ordering. So I went on to this BBC calculator to look at what are the tonnes of greenhouse gases that my chosen foods are emitting. And it occurs to me that beef and lamb from this, um, from this listing are really quite costly in carbon terms. So therefore that strengthened my resolve to cook more three bean chilies and focus more on beans and nuts as a part of our diet. I've also considered whether I can look at substitutes for dairy milk. All those things feel manageable, but actually food accounts for 25% of our greenhouse gas, gas emissions. So all such things make a difference. What I'd like to do now is to, is to finish and close with an opportunity for a reflection. And that's just to invite your thoughts on what can I do in order to move myself forwards, making a contribution towards climate change. What can we do perhaps as a family? What can we do perhaps as an organisation, so you're part of a community group, a company, um, a public sector body? What can we do as an organisation to move forwards towards these changes? And I hope this, uh, this talk has given you a sense of what is possible and a sense of momentum in moving forwards. Thank you very much for sharing your time with me. You've been marvellous. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was a fantastic talk and loads to think about there. Um, I, I personally loved the uh, circle of concern and, and circle of control slide. Um, and as uh, Paloma put in the chat as well, it's just very, um, it, it is very uh, appropriate at this time with uh, COVID as well and coming out of COVID and, and the, the feelings that we're all going through at the moment. Um, and yes, and I totally agree with your new habits, exactly like resume like this. I hope I hope it continues as well. And I hope we think about, um, do we need to travel to that meeting? Can we just have a quick, quick call over Zoom and just think how much carbon we'll reduce by doing that? I think it's fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Um, we, uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll have lots of uh, comments and questions for Elizabeth, so please use um, the Q&A button at the bottom to, to put in your questions at the end. And also we want to continue the conversation uh, after the, the webinars as well. So you might have, uh, some of you might have received our first um, newsletter last week, so they're finally up and running. Um, so if you, if you haven't signed up for that, uh, you can go on our website, futureplymouth2030.co.uk, and it's at the bottom uh, of the website. And um, basically, we want to obviously remind you of, of webinars that are coming up, but also continue the conversation on and update you with some of the topics that we've been talking about uh, and from some of the speakers as well. So uh, hopefully you can all sign up for that. Uh, our next speaker is Jackie Young, uh, and I'll put you through to her. Jackie. Hello, hi, um, good afternoon. Um, a lot of you will probably know me um, from the work that I've done on climate change and sustainability. Um, some of you might actually know me from the former 186 Carbon Network uh, that we ran for businesses in the city. Um, some of you might know me from the Climate Commission that we, we ran as well. Um, but at the moment, I'm a working with Environment Plymouth. Uh, we have some very close links with the Chamber of Commerce because one of the sectors that we work with is the business sector. And um, that's very much what I'm gonna sort of try and talk about today based on um, experience. And the things that we found in the last few years, she says, Right, there we go. Um, meaning business. Um, 
the change in sort of approaches, behaviours and attitudes is just as appropriate to business and industries. Um, I don't think people really quite understand how much the carbon footprint and climate change impacts on their business until for some reason the incentive to find out is boosted. Certainly in the last 15 to 20 years we've seen a lot of businesses taking up um, a lot of different actions on the environment and that's really encouraging um, but the question we still get from quite a lot is we want to do something but we don't know quite what so a lot of the work that we do is to basically reassure them that what they're doing is is quite okay it's it's all right to be concerned about it but it's also about advice and information, awareness and education. Does the carbon footprint of businesses really matter? Well, yes, it does, because if you look across the, the globe, even across the city, there is such a range of businesses doing all sorts of different things. And in each case, um, those businesses need to, to basically look at carbon footprints and their emissions and their climate change actions as another cost only this time it's in tons of carbon dioxide not necessarily in pound shillings and or pence but i will come back onto that in a minute everything we do has that cost it's that carbon footprint and our own approach can be definitely calculated but we're influenced by all sorts of additional spends this idea of embedded carbon it's not just what we do day to day it's the carbon and the carbon footprint of everything that creates what we are manufacturing, producing or dealing with. So resource extraction, energy production, transport and logistics, our food, our heat, our water, our light. And in most cases, what people often don't realize is reducing their carbon footprint can mean making savings some of the simplest actions they can take um, could be based on um, items that are left on standby overnight. It is so easy to just extend a finger and turn the screen off at the end of the day. And we've done some work with quite a few companies who've realized that um, their entire banks of computers were left on overnight for no particular reason. So that saving is absolutely essential. Now, that hasn't been lost on governments either. Um, some of you may remember in 2008, the carbon reduction commitment introduced a tax on the biggest carbon footprints, the, the biggest energy users in the UK. And 28 companies in Plymouth qualified for that. And we worked extensively with quite a few of them to identify what their carbon footprint was. It basically meant that you paid a, a fee, a levy for every tonne of carbon that you created and reducing that carbon through a carbon management plan meant that you were saving money as well as um, saving energy and the costs of the energy as well. Climate change levies have also had an impact. We're out of Europe now, but um, chances are that there will still be some climate levies that people will have to pay. But how to reduce them is another matter. Do you just ignore it you, or keep a watching brief and not really sort of take any action? Or do you make it work for you? And a lot of the companies we've worked with have actually turned this into a positive action. We've seen that huge change in business practice. Um, but I have to say that a lot of the hard work in, in Plymouth has been overlooked because a lot of businesses have done it because they had to, because they wanted to. They haven't really shouted very much about it. That does make a difference. Setting the scene um, and, and explaining why that is important um, has got a lot to do with incentives, whether that's competition or financial savings, whatever it happens to be. That's absolutely essential to the businesses we've been working with. Government figures for the footprint of every local authority are made available in about June or July every year, and they date back to 2005. So we can actually measure the progress that's been made in each area. Um, 2018 is the most up-to-date set we have due to limited access due to COVID. 
but the figures are always backdated by two years. So um, we're probably not going to find out about 2020 until 22 now. Now, in 2008, Plymouth um, introduced targets for a 20% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2013 and a 60% reduction by 2020 from 2025, 20, 2005 values. And uh, we were told, you'll never get it, you'll never make it, it will never happen. And I'm really pleased to say that the industrial and commercial sector in the city excelled themselves. Between um, 2005 and 2013, they managed to reduce their footprint from 584,600 tonnes of CO2 to 463,600 tonnes of CO2, a 20.7% reduction. So they met the 2013 target. Now by 2018, that footprint had reduced from 584,600 tonnes of CO2 in 2005 to an amazing 280,400 tonnes of CO2. That's 52.8% zero four percent with only two years to go um, and I'm pretty sure that if we carry on with the projected figures that we've got that we as a city will meet the 60 percent target that we set. There are all sorts of reasons for this though um, including the the 2008 crash um, that put a lot of companies out of business but the majority of reductions are in response to awareness and changes in behavior. The sort of questions that Elizabeth was mentioning, the sort of things that people are asking about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And I'm pleased to say that that is now continuing. Um, we used to say that if you get sort of a question about a particular topic from one business, then it's a, a general interest and you answer it. Just before Christmas, I had six questions from six different businesses, all completely independently sent through in one week. Uh, first time I've seen that for a long time. So what are the drivers here in the city? Um, what would drive the influences for change? And are they global or are they local? There's just a few suggestions here, which I, I picked up on. I'll go through each of these. Fossil fuels, um, they're seen as the cause of all evils, what most people blame for global warming. Um, but they are essential for driving a lot of the business manufacturing and production, even just turning the lights and the, and the IT on needs energy of one form or another. And it's driven very much by price and availability. It is in competition with the renewables and it's used to uh, boost the international trade and extensive logistical footprints that we have. But it also has a great deal to do with investment and the finance needed for pension funds. And you may have seen a lot of information about the calls for divestment, taking pension fund um, cash and finance away from the fossil fuel companies and investing them in eco-friendly companies, the renewables companies as particularly um, popular at the moment and people are beginning to use that for their marketing. In consumerism, um, a massive issue, we've grown used to a have-it-all approach creating competition across the board, the uh, strawberries in December, all the sorts of things that we've got used to. We can walk into a supermarket and pick them up um, at any time of the day or any time of the year but we don't have all the solutions and that cradle to grave issue of embedded carbon and, and the impact of emissions on climate change is only considered in some enlightened policies. Um, increasingly, we are seeing um, the US pick up on, on climate change and some of the most enlightened policies are coming out of the, the United States at the moment, regardless of what's happened in the last four years. So green options are increasingly popular. They look good. They, they make a company seem responsible. Corporate social responsibility goes up in people's estimations. And it's a selling point. Um, it can definitely help those companies that take the environment seriously and take climate change and their carbon footprint seriously 
quite apart from any savings they might make by introducing carbon management plans. And then there's governance and people. Um, one of the, the awkward things is that there hasn't really been that much guidance on um, anything to do with climate action from UK government until the recent 10 point plan. And even that has come in for um, a little bit of criticism because a lot of money was promised to back it up. But so far, we've not seen very much about how it's actually going to be delivered. One of the things that we're very keen on um, hearing about is the threat of taxation, a reintroduction of a type of carbon reduction commitment. Now, believe you me, back in 2008, nothing made companies move quite so quickly as the threat of a tax on their tons of carbon created from their emissions. Um, it's certainly been planned. It was talked about in the autumn by uh, Mr. Sunak, and it wouldn't surprise me if later in the year, it's introduced as a way of gaining some of the funding back from the amounts that's been spent on the, the COVID um, response. So COVID might mean a different way of working. Brexit might mean a different way of working, but there are opportunities that people can use. One that was mentioned there is working from home and doing um, online meetings rather than traveling all the way up to Exeter or wherever you need to go. We did some um, working out for the average commute in Plymouth because of the road layout and the, the hills is about six kilometers one way, so 12 kilometers a day. And that works out a, a, a phenomenal um, carbon footprint for anyone who's deciding to stay at home. So public opinion of what we're doing, how we're doing it, and the purchasing power that people have um, is going to be absolutely essential in future. <coughs> Excuse me. Locally, um, I think a lot more engagement is needed on this. Um, the business sector is going to be clouted in all sorts of ways by climate change, and um, they need a lot more reassurance than they're get currently getting. Uh, the three pictures here are uh, the wet walk um, back in 2014 when it was damaged by the extreme weather events. The middle picture is Derry's Cross roundabout in, I think, 1964. The water table under Derry's Cross is only about three foot underneath the the, the streets. So um, if you get a flooding incident, um, you know, it's going to cause problems. And I know there's one particular restaurant there that, that floods its basement every time there's a, a high tide. And the other building there is the um, Oceans Gate, um, the investment that's being made in green businesses and, and carbon neutral, carbon friendly businesses. But the local threats that people have got to face are going to be absolutely amazing drivers. Extreme weather events are going to put insurance prices up and the costs of repairs are going to go up too. I know there's a one particular organisation um, in the city which is terrified that come the next storm, they're not going to be able to get insurance cover anymore simply because they've been damaged so badly in the last couple of storms. Um, repairs, extreme weather events, they're, they're no sort of um, respecters of, of who you are or what you are. And if you're not expecting your roof to go, then it could be absolutely costly to replace it, quite apart from the fact that if you're a, sh a shop like Dunhill Mill in the last storm that we had, um, losing the roof of your main entrance caused the company to shut down for a few days. That means you're losing all of the commercial finance and income and investment as well. We need to be ready for new carbon taxes. Um, if they are applied, people will have to find them pretty quickly. We need to have an awareness and use green skills much more, green job opportunities. Um, they seem to be, from the government's idea, quite limited at the moment. And I've been talking to quite a few people who've try to identify what is meant by green skills and green jobs. 
there needs to be a lot more advice and awareness on this. Access, Elizabeth had the picture of the Dawlish railway line. Um, we can't really afford to lose access to the southwest for a whole range of reasons, including the um, element of tourism and the element of resource use. And access to resources, materials, energy and transport. How much are we doing to create our own energy to reduce our impact on transport? In terms of changing behaviour, um, a lot of new skills in carbon accountancy are going to be needed. Instead of just looking at um, the financial accountancy that most people are aware of, they're going to be able to need to transfer that and calculate that into a carbon footprint. And that's hopefully some work that we're going to be doing through the Chamber's new priority of environment and climate change. Boosting that awareness, boosting the um, skills that are needed to enable companies to take part in that. There is a possibility of a new low carbon business network to share that best practice. And I'd be very keen to know if people would be interested in joining that because it is a possibility that we could set up. And it's also about taking risks. Sometimes people look at the green options and decide, hmm, it's a bit too risky for me or no, nah, it's not going to affect me. Green has to be definitely green for go now. It's one of those things that we cannot afford now that we're coming towards the tipping point for climate change and global warming. We can't afford to ignore it. And lastly, governments and people. Um, Plymouth Climate Emergency Action Plan must take the business sector into account, um, not just those with money and influence to, to pay for the projects that are listed, but all of those businesses who are going to be affected by climate action through either adaptation to extreme events and climate change or mitigation, uh, working on their reduction of, of emissions in the next few years. Oceansgate, we need more of the same. Development and investment is absolutely essential. More companies looking at green additions to development plans and planning applications, and certainly diversity, young people and the future has got to be considered in more detail. So are we ready for green action? How will we know? The answer is possibly not yet. The opportunity to tackle climate change really does await the business sector at the moment and it could have a huge beneficial impact. Now in Plymouth that could mean leading the way locally, nationally and globally. We've already had some um, possible projects that are going to be dis um, displayed up at COP26 up in Glasgow later in the year. A national and international market and um, showcase for everything that we're doing. And I don't see any reason why Plymouth businesses shouldn't be um, showcased in that way. It could mean substantial financial savings for businesses. If they do the right thing, they will save money on their emissions. And a way of recovering from the recent challenges. All sorts of green possibilities have been proposed. And I think that's possibly because people have noticed the, the little things rewilding the landscape around a factory or an office um, might lead to more birdsong, more trees, more wild meadows. The options can be simple and cheap to carefully planned action and investment, but they definitely don't have to be extensively expensive. The worst case scenario we face is that climate change forces companies out of business for whatever reason, supplies, damage, insurances, not taking public in opinion into account. It doesn't just stop. It has to be a growing concern. So we obviously like to hear your views and the, the behaviour change that we, don't, we want to see can definitely be supported. So, you know, if you are involved and you want to be involved in taking this forward, please either contact Stuart or Helen at the Chamber of Commerce or Environment Plymouth on info at environmentplymouth.org and we'll do our best to put you in the right direction because we're all in this together, business or individual or households. And hopefully we can make it work for us as opposed to the opposite, which is not really worth thinking about. But thank you very much for listening.
thank you so much again, Jackie. That, that was a fantastic presentation. Again, loads, loads to think about. Uh, and I totally agree, but Plymouth could definitely lead the way in, in, in this, um, you know, forward um, road to reducing a carbon footprint. And as we've said so many times on, on the programme, there's so many different wonderful projects going on in Plymouth. Um, and we don't really shout about enough. So thank you so much for that presentation. Um, please continue getting your questions in uh, for uh, the end of the programme by clicking the Q&A button. Uh, finally, we have Roy Jones uh, from the University of Plymouth. Over to you, Roy. Hello, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as uh, Miles said, I'm Dr. Rory Jones from uh, the University of Plymouth, and I want to talk about um, carbon reduction through changing occupant behavior. So. so um, I'm not a psychologist, um, so, I am a lecturer in built environment, um, and this presentation is um, the work of um, many, many people, many um, very talented colleagues that I work with, many um, who are psychologists working in the School of Psychology at the University of Plymouth as well. And what I want to um, talk about in the next 20 minutes or so is um, about carbon reduction, carbon reduction uh, through changing um, occupant behavior. And I primarily mean um, energy reduction and therefore the uh, carbon emissions reductions that we can achieve as a, as a result of that. So um, I thought by starting with a little bit of um, background to uh, why um, addressing energy use is really um, important and particularly addressing people's um, behavior. So people's behavior um, plays a key part in the energy performance of um, buildings. You'll have heard the, uh, the phrase, uh, buildings don't use energy, uh, people do. So people have a really um, key role in influencing how much um, energy our buildings use. Um, but we have a number of um, challenges around how we actually can um, change uh, people's behavior and get them to reduce their energy use. And one of the uh, major obstacles to doing that is that this concept of um, energy is very abstract, it's also invisible, and people uh, feel um, psychologically distant from the problem. Um, and by that, they not only um, struggle to see um, how their immediate actions, whether turning up the thermostat, for example, or um, unplugging um, devices, et cetera, um, has an impact on their own energy at home, but also um, what are the wider um, implications of those behaviours in terms of um, energy um, on the grid up to um, a larger scale impacts on um, climate change and the climate emergency. So um, that's a key challenge. Then there is um, generally a poor understanding of how much energy is used for different purposes and what savings could be made by changing our day-to-day behaviour. So people struggle to understand if I change this uh, behavior in my home or that one, what, it, what kind of savings could be achieved? Um, and what, which action should I take priority in um, changing if I was to go in to try to um, make changes? There's also issues around poor self-motivation for dealing with energy issues. Um, let's face it, we all have um, other priorities in our life and energy often um, features very low down on that priority list. So for many people, even um, getting the time in the day to even think, let alone be motivated to start acting on um, their energy use at home or at work is um, quite far away. So there's a, a motivation issue that we have to overcome as well. Behaviour change has also, so the discussions about behaviour change and what we can do have been increasingly moving away from those face-to-face -face interactions where we would meet someone and say, I've done this, maybe you could try that at your home to save energy. And we're moving um, more and more into um, internet, social media applications um, for those discussions generally in life. And has that never been more uh, relevant than in, the, than in the last year? So um, we have um, these sort of discussions happening more and more um, online 
um, computer based. And therefore, um, there's some uh, research suggested that ICT based solutions, so ICT information technology solutions, um, can play a pivotal role in providing uh, feedback on people's energy use and making those invisible energy flows more visible to people and therefore have the potential to potentially um, educate, engage and, um, and, and um, empower occupants to, um, and people to um, take actions. And what I want to talk to you about um, today is about a project where we try to develop an ICT based solution to start doing some of um, these things and to help people um, change their behavior and save energy use. And it's um, a Plymouth uh, based uh, case study um, project that I want to talk about. So the project I want to um, focus on is uh, a project called Energy Aware. It has the long name energy game for awareness of energy efficiency in social housing communities and it was uh, funded under the European um, Horizon 2020 research and innovation program and they put out a call uh, for projects uh, research projects under the uh, title of developing new um, ICT based solutions for energy efficiency and um, in 2015 we were successful in this project it was a two million um, euro uh, based project and it was going to initially last for um, three years um, it feels like the project's gone on much longer than that we were still working on some of the stuff even up to the last year and what we um, brought together was a number of organizations uh, both uk based and across europe so us at the University of Plymouth, both um, the Department of the Built Environment, where I'm based, and also the School of Psychology. We also worked with Devon and Cornwall Housing, which is one of the largest um, social housing providers in the Southwest at the time, um, to engage um, their um, um, tenants and um, households in the project. We worked with EDF Energy UK, so a large energy provider involved. And there are a number of other partners, another university in Spain, Freeman Corp developed the game-based solution, which I'm going to introduce you to, and then another university in Portugal and um, another um, ICT um, company in Spain. And um, as the uh, logo um, shows, it was a very much a um, Plymouth-based uh, project. The idea came from um, the university, but the game that was designed and the piloting and testing all happened um, in, in Plymouth. So I think it's really um, exciting and relevant for Plymouth um, 2030. So um, at the beginning of the project, uh, we had a name. Um, what we wanted to be able to do was to essentially try to help decrease energy consumption and thus carbon emissions by working with social housing tenants to understand and engage in energy efficient, efficiency and try to ultimately um, change their behavior. I want to also note that social housing was um, given to us as a um, use group by the um, European um, uh, by the European Commission for this uh, project and I can understand that there are many other groups um, who potentially could benefit far much more from such a solution but we were um, initially we had to uh, work with um, the social housing um, um, groups. So um, that was our aim and the project um, proposed that we were going to um, develop and test in uh, 100 homes based in Plymouth, a serious game that could be linked to the actual energy consumption of that home. So back in 2015, we were right at the beginning of the smart meter rollout. So all the homes in the UK were going to get smart meters with 30 minutely electricity and gas data that would be available. And many of us have got these little screens in our home that with speed dials on that tell us how much energy we're using. And the idea was, could we leverage that data in a more exciting way than just a speedo, um, small interface you would have in your home? Could we embed it within, a, within some sort of game to try to you know, improve engagement with that. And we also wanted to get this game and try to um, embed it in wider social media and networking tools. So when people were playing with this game, they could also start to do those connections with people via um, social media to discuss what they tried or to um, exchange energy efficiency advice, etc. So that was the aim that we um, set out with. 
So um, we also wrote that um, the idea of this game would be to try to educate uh, people in the ways in which they can um, energy can be saved in their home through um, two um, avenues. One through installing energy efficiency measures such as um, um, cavity wall insulation, loft insulation, etc. But also day-to-day um, -day activities through changing um, their behaviours at home. And we also really wanted to look at this balance between saving energy but also maintaining people's comfort and and subsequently their health etc so we want to look at the interface of those two things we wanted to try to encourage um, discussion of energy issues in social networking platforms to see if we can get people to start talking about about energy and um, how they could um, change their behavior and one of the key things we set out with at the beginning is we wanted this um, solution to be an entertaining game for a diverse audience of people. We wanted to get young people uh, from children with their parents playing this game through to, um, to say the more elderly end of um, the spectrum as well, to try to engage everyone. And one of our key aims at the beginning was to try to make this game a solution that wasn't, I'm playing a game to save energy. I want to play, it. the idea was that we would um, design a game where people would play it, they would enjoy playing that game, but also pick up hints and tips and actions that they could take to um, help them save energy at homes. And um, the goal was um, to help uh, people to understand how much energy um, is, old, is used in their home. So we had this um, set up where we would have these um, series of uh, pilot houses across Plymouth and we were going to um, develop a um, serious game and that serious game was going to be able to help people improve their energy awareness and um, hopefully ultimately trigger um, energy savings and um, behavior change actions and what was um, really interesting and what we wanted to achieve is that many of us have these um, apps on our phone where you know if you want to get to the next level or you want the uh, the next unlockable you have to then start paying with your credit card what we wanted to try to filter into this game was the ability that if people then actually saved energy in their home and measured through the smart meters that have been installed this would then unlock um, additional levels and currency that people could then use so there was some sort of positive feedback about if they actually learned something from the game they then took that into their own home made savings that that would then filter back through and as i've said before we wanted to um, try to allow these people to um, connect out wider into um, social media and networking tools in order to share the knowledge that they gained and to um, feel more part of the community generally. So that was um, the key goals that we had at the beginning. As I said, we worked with um, what was Devon and Cornwall Housing at that time. They are um, were one of the largest um, social housing providers in the southwest. They had nearly 23,000 homes across the Southwest. And we, the project was specifically focused on Plymouth and, um, De and in Plymouth, they DCH maintained and um, managed uh, nearly well, 2,777 households. And what we were going to do in the, uh, what we did in the project was um, um, recruit um, 100 homes from those 2,777 and we installed um, energy um, smart meters into the homes, into 100 of the homes, and they were there for 24 months. And then, so we monitored a 12 month baseline period to understand what sort of energy these homes had, uh, were using for 12 months. And then in half of the homes, we deployed this energy aware serious game into half for another 12 months to see whether that would have any um, effect on their energy use. So the idea uh, was we, we had this project uh, initially for three years and it broke down more or less into these um, stages. So um, at the very beginning of the project, what we wanted to do was um, develop some requirements around the game. What should it be able to do? But more importantly, what did the, the user group that we wanted to engage already know about energy? And what did they not know about energy? Where were their motivations and things that were interesting to them that we could try to um, leverage and engage them in some way. So we ran a series of um, pieces of work, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, 
to, um, to gather those requirements, which also included um, a number of workshops and focus groups with the um, end user group um, to help us in, in designing it. That, those ideas were then taken forward into an initial prototype design. So we developed a prototype that we um, tested a beta version with um, some people that were involved at the beginning in helping us design. And then we rolled out this um, serious game um, into the uh, pilot homes. At the very beginning, we, as I said, we installed smart meters for electricity and gas in all of the 100 homes. We monitored for um, their energy use for 12 months. And then for the 50 homes that we were interested in seeing what would be the impacts of this serious game, we deployed the game and then we measured um, the intervention over an um, initial baseline period. So what was the impact on um, their energy use short term? So very, we deployed the game, did it have a short impact? I, we sometimes see that energy use savings are very high initially, but then they degrade over time. Um, and then we did a number of um, assessment points midterm and then one 12 months on from when we um, initially deployed. And what we wanted to um, look at essentially was we had these uh, two groups of households, 50 in each group. We had the experimental group that would be um, playing with the game and a control group who were just having their energy use uh, monitored, but were having no feedback or um, additional um, intervention taking place. And we wanted to look at how their energy use would change within their groups. So between uh, what they were initially using during the baseline period to what they uh, were using at the end of the project, but also we did comparisons between the groups. Um, and what we wanted to um, look at was um, the potential energy savings for gas and electricity. We also tried to, um, through the game, help people to try to start understanding their impact of when they use energy at home as well in order to try to help them um, shift their peak energy demands away from those points in um, when uh, grid demand is high and we have to start another power station. So we start to look at, could we try to flatten or shift uh, people's energy use in terms of timing? We run, in addition to those um, um, information that came from the smart meters, we run surveys throughout all of it to try to capture what changes people made in terms of their behavior? Um, did their energy awareness increase through this process? Did they start to share some knowledge about energy with other people? And one of the key things we came, and this was added very early on in the project, is we found that IT literacy amongst um, some of the groups was generally poor. So did we help people to start to be able to use IT tools a bit more effectively? And also we found um, a group of, um, tenants um, who were spending a large amount of time alone and could this uh, platform not only help with energy use but allow people to connect with each other so that was um, the time planning so the initial um, game design we um, wanted to as i say develop a number of requirements to inform the game what we did at the university initially was um, uh, look at behavior change principles and other games for change, serious games, um, and what um, features they have to engage people and what ones would be appropriate in this context. We also run a very large um, social housing um, survey with all 2000 odd households in Plymouth to understand um, their social demographics also what, is their, what are their, were their current energy consumption habits and perceptions? And also um, what sort of IT tools were they already using? So we wanted to try to understand that um, group that we were going to try to run this intervention with. We also, um, DCH uh, made their stock condition database available to us. So we wanted to look at what was the current state of the housing stock they had in order for us to be providing useful education to um, the types of houses that these people um, were living in, i.e. we're not talking about biomass boilers when there was no biomass boilers at all in Plymouth. So we tried to make it relevant to um, the end user group. And then, as I said, we run a series of focus groups really early on in the project um, using a living lab methodology where we brought the, the people that would be uh, testing this thing at the end right into the beginning and ask them, what do you want and how should it work? So um, 
there were a number of things that came out of the behavior um, change uh, principles. We wanted to, them to be able to make some sort of connection with uh, real life. Um, so whatever the game was, it should be able to be um, translated and um, applied to their everyday um, life to take a useful action, not just in the game, but also in their real life. Personalization seemed really important, the ability to be able to um, make it relevant to, to them. Um, goals and feedback had been seen as a really key um, driver. So being able to set goals, I want to try to say this and then get some feedback on whether that had been achieved. We saw in the literature that social influence was um, key in helping to change people's behavior. So knowing um, what other people are doing and how well they're, they're doing could help you to um, be um, motivated to keep going as well. Um, we tried to put some reminders and in, um, prompts into the game. So when people started to lose attention and weren't no longer focused, could we uh, prompt and bring them back into trying to um, be involved in the, uh, in the project? Encouragement and rewards. So I said there was this feedback cycle where they were, if they saved energy, they would get um, rewards within the game. And then um, we wanted to be able to um, provide information to them about behavior and also about the consequences of the potential uh, behaviors um, that they um, had. As I said, there was also a large um, social housing survey that was undertaken as well with all of um, DCH homes in Plymouth. Um, 537 of those uh, kindly uh, responded to us. And um, some really interesting things came out of that about what sort of um, behaviors or motivations they had. And there were a number of um, concerns that came through in that um, survey they wanted to highlight. So 23% of the residents found it um, difficult to afford their energy bills. So there was some sort of internal motivation to, matter, to you know, take action. 41% of residents were worried about their energy bills. 42% of residents thought they could not save any more energy, which was really concerning for us at the beginning of the project. And that comes back to my earlier point about is the social housing um, um, household the most uh, relevant for such a solution? So there's a concern that they couldn't actually do any more. 29% of uh, residents um, did not understand how their homes used energy, which was really exciting, of course, if we could help them to understand, maybe they could take action. Positives we found from that survey were that 60% of the residents thought about how they could save energy. So they were engaged in some way and they wanted to think about it. They were also 65% more or less were willing to save energy if we, we could provide them the right support. They had the motivation, but they just didn't know exactly what to do and could someone support them. And then 55% of the residents um, said that their friends and family also thought it was important. So we saw some sort of ability that they might be able to then help others or to get help from others to um, take forward um, this. So as I said, we gathered a number of um, things that people were already um, doing at home or not doing at home in order so that we weren't um, teaching or trying to help them do things that they already knew what to do. So things that people always reported doing was turning off lights when they leave the rooms, for example, not having their windows open when the heating was on. So these are things that they were already um, doing and were quite aware of. But then there were more um, complex actions um, that people reported never, never doing. And most of those were around adjusting temperatures in different areas of their homes, minimizing showering time, closing doors between rooms. So zoning your home, so only heating the bits that um, you need. So we, we try to um, focus on being able to um, address the bits that were um, different and unaware to people. As I said, we run a number of um, focus groups with, um, with um, the um, tenants right at the beginning of the game. And we kind of hand it over to them to give us um, some cues about what, um, what, what did they want this game to look like and how would it be most relevant to them? So they um, came with, they wanted a realistic game, which was close to, real, close to reality, which comes back to the literature that, you know, being able to, relate in some way to our real life actually will have um, some useful positive impact. They wanted the ability to customize a house, looking at energy efficiency house upgrades, so retrofit um, and um, 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 insulation solutions. 
They also were interested in this balance between health and balancing health with energy consumption and comfort at home. So they wanted the game to do that. They wanted to be able to um, learn how to compare energy deals. Back in 2015, everyone was talking about changing the energy provider and um, they, they were really keen on that element. Um, they wanted to be able to assess the impact of the installation of energy efficiency measures and behavior change actions. So they wanted to be able to see from the game if I, which actions are more important than others and in what context. They came up with the idea of understanding, wanting to understand from the game extreme situations. What should I do in freezing cold winter versus those um, sweaty, hot summers? What should I be doing in energy in those contexts? And they wanted some sort of um, in-game currency to reflect uh, real life money and environmental issues. And um, they wanted a number of co cooperative and competitive features. So they came with a massive list of um, wants and desires. And we tried our best to bring those together. And um, this was a really, um, I really enjoyed this part of the project. And we had um, people from um, really young, 18 through to 80, 90 year olds um, at the other end of the scale participating in this. So this is one of the early uh, prototypes that came together, um, which became um, Energy Cat, the house of tomorrow. And the game that came together was um, um, a Sims style um, game where um, the characters in the game were um, a cat that was controlled by you as the player versus um, a human that wandered around doing all sorts of uh, poor energy for efficiency behaviors, et cetera. And you as the cat, it was your role to go around and correct those. And the cat's aim was to, if he could help the, um, his, his owner to save energy, that um, allowed him to be able to then upgrade the home to the house of tomorrow, to the future, smart home, uh, highly energy efficient home. So there was a number of features that ended up in the game. So being able to um, manage the house, customize the house, transform it over time in terms of what it looked like, but also in terms of its energy efficiency. And it contained a uh, real energy data visualization tool. So from the smart meter data that we were collecting, we were able to provide them some feedback on their actual energy use um, through the game as well. Some of the actions that they could undertake was, as I said, undertaking house upgrades, so installing insulation measures, but also upgrading the appliances from uh, very inefficient that they started with at the beginning through to you know, A plus uh, rated appliances. Um, they looked at energy, um, um, various different um, energy saving behaviors were um, taught or suggested through the game. Looking at this balance, so the role of the game was to balance um, saving energy versus um, people's comfort. So in that example, they were saving quite a bit of energy, but um, the person was really miserable. And then um, the idea was they would take away energy saving advice and hopefully boost their energy use awareness. So that was the first beta version that we tested that ultimately became uh, this, which is um, Energy Cat, um, the house of tomorrow. And as I said, you, the black cat was dumped, he, this ginger cat um, came in and this is um, the beginning um, of the game at level two. So you start with a very basic home where you're trying to balance these two things, as I said, energy savings versus um, comfort. And by the time you just got to level 20, people had been starting to produce really quite interesting games with uh, houses with different amounts of insulation, etc. cetera. Um, the game um, was, or probably still is available in the app store and the other and um, there were a number of uh, things that built over time into this to keep trying to be keep people engaged over time there were a number of different things that came available such as a winter season where the people could understand about the you know energy use for their christmas lights for example to try to trigger and get people back in and once uh, people had their own home, we started to build in some additional levels so people could then start trying to help other people, the energy cat could start helping other people up the street with their own challenges. And it became more and more difficult up to um, the Green's house where they were essentially doing everything that was possible and how do you um, help these people to go potentially a bit further. It was translated into um, a number of European languages. So if you're from, uh, Spain, France or Portugal, you can have it in your own language as well. 
So what was the outcome of um, the project? So we found that households playing um, the game saved uh, three and a half percent on their electricity consumption on average compared to their uh, baseline energy use and um, seven and a half percent on their gas consumption compared to the baseline period. Over the same um, period of time, the control group, the one that wasn't, um, wasn't playing with the game at all, actually increased their energy use a bit, so 1.7% increase in electricity consumption and 1.2% in their gas consumption. And there was, um, we saw that there was a significant difference in understanding over time with subjects being, uh, being more likely to state that they understood how their own home used energy in the final stage of the project, as opposed to in the baseline stages. I have one last um, plug. So I'm currently involved in a, um, a really um, exciting project um, called uh, Sustainability Hub Low Carbon Devon. It's a new project running at the university to support Devon-based enterprises to access research and engage with the university academics around the low carbon agenda. So if you are a Devon-based enterprise, this could be interesting to you. Um, there are a number of things going on over the next uh, couple of years. We're running a number of our own uh, knowledge and network exchange events. So come along to those if you want to hear about um, how to address carbon issues. There's also a number of um, other things you can do as a business. We have a number of really cool um, uh, industrial research fellows that are employed in the project, looking at things such as green walls, power electronics, PV, creative industries, and if, um, you're interested in the stuff that I do. I'm working uh, with a research fellow around energy efficiency in buildings and occupant behavior. So if you're a company and you want to access some of our knowledge and um, get in contact with the project. Um, there's also a number of um, low carbon internships that are available through the project, fully funded by Low Carbon Devon. So if you're a Devon based um, um, enterprise and you would like to take on one of our cool um, skilled graduates and students to focus on a low carbon issue in your business, um, we, we are offering um, fully funded um, internships of one to three months if you're interested in that. And contact Sustainability Hub at Plymouth.ac.uk. Um, I think I am done. If you have any questions about the presentation, I'm here for the next um, half hour or so. But, uh, but afterwards, by all means, get in contact with me by email. Amazing. Thanks so much, Rory. Uh, I've just posted a link to your Energy Cat game there. Um, I'm looking forward to playing that tonight, seeing how I get on. Um, I, hope, I hope it um, still works as well as it did. Obviously, if you download it, if you download it without a smart meter, obviously there are some features of the game that won't work as um, well because uh, yeah, there's not sure. that positive feedback element. But um, yeah, it's, if it's still there and people want to download it, that's that's great. That's great. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks very much, Rory. Uh, and yeah, enjoy your tips as well. Um, one that I certainly don't do is close doors between rooms. So I'll do that as well to try and save a bit, a bit of energy there. Um, there's lots, obviously, loads of things that um, to digest. So um, we're going to move on to our Q and A shortly. So please um, have a think about some questions and submit them now, uh, either in the chat Q and A or be brave and raise your hand. And uh, whilst you're doing that, I just want to remind you of our next webinar and a few other things. So our next webinar is uh, behavior behavior change again, uh, but this time it's focused uh, on education. Um, so it's a little bit of a different angle. Um, we have a Chris Woodfield uh, from Low, Low Carbon Devon's Knowledge Exchange Officer at the University of Plymouth, and he's going to talk about how we can empower students uh, to change, uh, to be change leaders and role models for a brighter future. And we also have uh, Emma Hewitt of Building Plymouth, um, and she's going, to, she's going to talk us through Plymouth City Council's strategy and research and programme to build back cleaner and greener following our COVID crisis that we've had. And we also have Jessica Ferner, who's only 19 years old, um, but she's speaking about uh, the local youth par parliament group uh, and their current projects and initi initiatives in relation to the climate emergency. So a really great um, programme lined up. That's the 24th of March, again, at the same time, 4 p.m. Also, please keep looking at our website. Um, it, it's only going up to um, episode 10 at the moment, but we still have lots more to show you. 
Uh, and I can also announce uh, exclusively that we are hopefully going to continue with the programme after the summer as well, uh, as it's been so successful. Um, and topics are coming up include um, health and well-being of children, stru structural engineering options, future, future transport plans, uh, delivery of net zero carbon projects, and so much more. Um, so please keep checking the website or, or um, sign up for our newsletter as we'll um, keep updating you with the up and coming events. Um, also, we, we're starting to make our Twitter and Instagram really active as well. So please join us on Twitter, Future Plym 2030, uh, and also our Instagram, Future Plymouth 2030 as well. And also, as I mentioned earlier, we have, now have our YouTube channel up and running. Uh, so if you want to uh, watch again some of our webinars or have them on in the background whilst you're working over the, over the week, um, please go to our website, Future Plymouth 2030, and click watch again, uh, and you'll see all our back catalogue. Um, so I'm just going to invite all our um, panellists back on, uh, and we will go through some questions. Uh, so Jackie, so uh, we have a few raised hands. That's that's a rarity. Thank you very much. So um, Matthew, can I ask uh, can I ask you uh, to ask your question? Okay, thanks, Miles. <clears throat> I've got two questions. Uh, one for Rory. I'd be really interested to know. Fascinating um, tool that you've developed there. The the uh, game. Um, have, did you consider, and what do you think is the potential for that game to be used in schools? Because I think it's really important that you know we engage with the next generation. I'm sure kids would really um, you know embrace that game and building awareness there, and then using the child's awareness and enthusiasm to actually drive their parents forward in changing attitudes at home. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. And then I have a second question for. Uh, Elizabeth and Jackie, I'd be interested. Um, what what are the sort of what are the frictions between um, change behaviour when it's through freedom of choice versus change being imposed upon us? Now I'm thinking COVID. They've, we've had certain rules imposed upon us um, versus um, when we see a direct impact of something like flooding, you know, we decide to make the change ourselves. So is there any data, is there any theory or thinking behind the, what is more effective, imposed or um, chosen change? So those are my two questions or points for discussion, should I say. Thanks, Matthew. Shall I go first? Yeah, be great, Rory. Yes. So, um, yes, thank you um, for the question. So, honestly, we're not currently working with schools, but I absolutely understand that it could be really an interesting thing to do. Um, from the project perspective, we did have a number of families involved. So, um, and one of the key things, so we did um, some qualitative research, which I didn't talk about today. Um, go into some of these households afterwards and actually did some interviews with them about what they um, what they got from the game etc and so we heard a lot from um, the uh, family families involved that it was um, indeed the, the children that interaction with parents being able to sit with children and play the game together or the other way around where the children um, you know, were playing it and telling their parents you know we could do this we could do that so really absolutely I think there's a really um, exciting um, avenue to explore about getting um, parents and, um, and and from the children to um, get more people engaged in this. So um, yes, yeah, so it's not something that we're currently doing, but um, the, the the app is apparently there, still available, and there's no reason why we couldn't um, take it forward um, to to work with um, schools. So, thanks. Okay. It'd be interesting to see how it could become part of curriculum, maybe. Anyway, yeah, interesting. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, Rory. Um, we've got a question from Alan Ramage. Alan, are you there? I am. Hi. Um, it's a question yeah. which for Catherine, but also Jackie and Rory may have a, an input too, because it would help Rory. He's talking about um, low carbon projects and manufacture, um, 
No, the question is to, is to Catherine initially. Um, Mark Carney in the 2020 Beath lecture lectures said there is a need to mobilize mainstream finance to help all companies to get to net zero. And he's saying people can do this, can help do this through their savings in a bank account, their pension pots and their investments. How would you promote this behavior? And to Jackie, has PCC a role in promoting this behavior in the, you know, Plymouth public, among the Plymouth public? Can I just first? <laughs> You said your question was for Catherine? Yeah, yeah sorry, apologies, I've written your name, Kat Elizabeth, my handwriting. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. So perhaps if I take one part of it, and then I think Jackie's also got comments, which is, so your question is about how can we mobilise and incentivize those behaviours? And I think humans are intensely smart and we realise what's in our, in our best interests within nanoseconds. So the straightforward way to make finance and savings and investments um, compelling that are green is to make sure that those are good investments. Um, so it depends why people wish to invest and everyone has a different approach to investment. Um, but the key thing there is showcasing and showing um, the, the returns and that's social returns as well as the classic um, the classic returns because those of us who are interested in um, investing in green may also be interested to see social impact reported, social value reported, as well as um, the, the classic return on investment profitability. Thank you. Um, two interesting questions, one from Matthew and one, one from Alan there. Um, in terms of the difference between imposing and choosing um to to take action originally we found that companies that were being told to go green resisted it there was a sort of very much a sort of you know who you know who are you to tell us what we should be doing but interestingly the response we've got from some of the um environment policy units around the city is that when they've actually introduced things like saving plastic or um, anything to do with climate action, a lot of the employees have re responded with relief. They've been pleased that the company is now taking action on it and are quite happy to help them out. So it's it's a bit of a sort of an odd situation that you don't you don't know who's going to take you on board and who's going to. Um, do what you're asking them to do until you actually ask them and in most cases people go and say oh thank god for that you you know you caught up with the rest of the world um in terms of the the role of the city council um obviously when we had I, as alan knows i used to work with the council on climate change issues we had the climate change commission which was very much involved with both businesses and the academic <coughs> education sector um and a lot of what we did was awareness and um, information and education, the, the skills side of it. What most companies want to do, whether it's investment, divestment, pension funds, whatever it happens to be, is they want to know how and they want the skills and they want to know, you know, what do I have to do? That awareness and education, as far as I know, is no longer provided by the council. So although there are loads of... Um, wonderful aspirations in the in the climate action plan one of the things that we really want to see is something that brings people together to learn more about how to take this action how to respond to the government how to turn your it off at the end of the day how to close doors between rooms because unless people are in some cases led into good behavior they won't really do the research for themselves it's 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 seen as too complex they they need somebody to lead um from the start from the top and that could be anybody and that's one of the reasons why the chamber is looking to, to have this this new priority and one of the first things that Stuart and i discussed was whether or not there was a good case for having a new network where these sort of things will be exchanged almost like a sort of um future learn website um, you know, if you want to learn more about energy efficiency, then speak to whoever. Um, 
it's absolutely essential that people aren't just left hanging, you know, wanting to do something, but not understanding how they can do it. So just to build on Jackie's point there, I think the, the separation between being compelled and being incentivized or, or doing something voluntarily um, is a really interesting one. But in reality, they don't exist separately. Um, what is really compelling is anyone who can tell us what good looks like. Um, we continually scan the horizon to look for what good looks like. We look to our peers, we look to organisations. And, and basically for me, compulsion, that is to say things that we are forced to do, lags best practice and innovators. So there are those amongst us who will reaction very readily and will not wait for regulation, that is to say compulsion to act. And an example of that would be mask wearing. So Ross Paloma in the comments there has made a statement about I'm interested in compulsion versus um, voluntary action. I noticed that the two are linked because we started wearing masks before we were required to wear them. And as soon as we saw each other wearing masks, the mask wearing behavior escalated. And actually masks were mandated in, in July, but people have been wearing masks for some months before it became regulation. So regulation and compulsion can lag voluntary behavior. I think what's quite powerful in behavior change terms is to show people what good looks like. Uh, that is the role of some regulation. That is the role of us as in our community groups. That's the role of us as individuals and our families. Keep exploring what good looks like. And that generates a lot of momentum and motivation. I suppose that's also continuing on your point from uh, using Glastonbury, Elizabeth, as you know, they started promoting, uh, you know, reusable bottles. And it, it was, you know, cool to do I that. Had to have one. Uh, How was <laughs> to do this? Yeah. Like, becomes something that you think is of culture, is of the moment, is, is therefore something I choose to do. And I'm just aware of my own and others' tendency to, as, a, as an adult, um, I don't like being told what to do. I'd much rather be engaged with it, and I'd much yeah. rather have choices. So however we choose to change, when we're dealing with a whole population and, and adults, I think um, yeah, we want to show you what good looks like also engage them with it rather than tell um, because telling me can bring out my inner stroppy teenager and I can become rebellious then yeah definitely thank you thanks, relating, Elizabeth. Thank relating you. to that stroppy teenager <laughs> uh, thank you so much Alan for your question there uh, and thank you for asking it live that's brilliant um, to, to our whole panel, um, we have we have a question here from John Canton. Um, he's he's referenced a, a paper uh, or some research from the GHG mission levels. Um, but the main point of his question really is um, what what psychology for behaviour change can delegates use at COP26 to firstly persuade the UK government, who is uh, who presumably must be led by example, and then China and the nineteen other countries who also admit. 80% um, of the global total GHG to radically reverse their targets to deliver 90 times their currently planned NDC reductions. Bit of a big one there, but can I can I ask uh, maybe Rory for your comments on that first? Wow, yeah, that is a, a big, big question. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I have the answer, so I'm not going to even start to pretend that I have the answer to that um, question, but for sure um, the UK um, this year has a really um, important um, role through um, the COP in, uh, in Glasgow later this year to um, be that role model on a very big stage to show what we are doing mm. as, a, as a country to, um, to address our carbon emissions across, across our economy, and um, I hope that um, we take forward some really um, key uh, core examples of the stuff we are doing um, nationwide to, to do that. And um, I think um, role models and championing, and we seem to be as a, 
the UK government does seem to be started positioning itself to be that champion for um, net zero, um, addressing the climate emergency, etc. That we can own then. Um, if we show the best of us and the things that we are doing well and start to try to take actions ourselves, we can hopefully take other people and other countries with us, um, with, with us forward in that as well. Um, I think that's um, the, the best political answer I can uh, give to that question. Thanks, Rory. Elizabeth, Jackie, would you have anything to add to that? Um, yes, it's it's a little bit awkward, but it's it's almost the same with all forms of governance, whether that's national government, local government, whatever it happens to be. Um, it's one thing issuing lists of aspirations, targets, we're going to do this, we're going to fund that. But when it comes down to it, people will be looking to delivery and which promises are broken, um, whether or not um, all of this hot air, if you'll pardon the pun, has been worth it and whether the delivery has actually done anything positive. This is, this is one of the problems we've got with the, um, the current government's 10 point green recovery plan at the moment. Again, loads of really great aspirations, but a lot of people have said, but we don't have any idea of how we're supposed to deliver this, what a green job is supposed to be looking like. And if they seriously think that it, they're going to sort of deliver all of their national targets on planting trees, they've got another thing coming because they really need to be much more creative and much more innovative about some of the things that companies in Plymouth are already doing and some of the research is already supporting. Because if they don't, they're going to be seen as massively hypocritical. And you could understand why the Chinas and Indias of this world would turn around and say, why should we listen to you? And, and mm. as for the US, well, I think, you know, Joe Biden has already created a huge sigh of relief across the US to, with his attitude to um, rejoining the Paris Agreement. But Joe Biden yeah. would have every right to turn around to the UK and say, look, hang on, you're supposed to be leading on this and you haven't done a bloody thing. You've said a lot. You've, ex you know, expressed a lot of hot air enough to fund or enough to, to energize COP26. <laughs> but what are you actually doing about it? it in, with most companies, and most, most organizations, most people, it's the proof, proof of the pudding, the reality of it. If they can be seen to be making a difference and improving things, then people will believe in them and they'll vote for them. If they're not, then they won't. It's that simple. And I think the voting and peer pressure are key answers to the question. So how can we focus our efforts and focus a government's attention? Well, as humans in our teams, in our organisations and our lives as a whole, we're very, very motivated to be seen as good people and good people who do good things. So the peer pressure of being at a conference and a requirement to showcase and show what I can do and the accountability of potential for Joe Biden to ask an awkward question about what we've been doing. All of those things are, are the magic buttons to motivate change. And for me, the, the fact that we know ultimately we will vote for each other, we will vote for a party, we will vote for an individual, is what keeps people's attention focused on what's the impact? How are we showing the impact of what we're doing? So what we can do um, to contribute to that is focus on impact, ask questions about impact. Thanks guys, yeah, some real great discussion there, totally agree. Um, Matthew, oh, just I just Miles. Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, I think um, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer, but fascinating. I think it's a top down and a bottom up approach. Um, you know, we have seen the global institutions like the World Bank, IMF and others eroded over the last five years. They, they need to be rebuilt because uh, uh, greater transparency and accountability through these institutions to some of the investment that's happening in the developing world. Um, so they need to be rebuilt to provide that support, but also bottom up, we as um, people paying into pensions, we can put a lot of pressure on through our pension, select the, the funds we select to invest in. 
you know, um, Standard Chartered Bank, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, Mitsubishi have all recently pulled out of coal fired power station investment projects in Vietnam because of investor concerns and pressure from the pension funds. So, you know, and that's causing Vietnam as a country to switch more towards solar and wind. So we do have the ability to put a lot of pressure on governments globally, I believe. Definitely. Thank you, Matthew. Would, you, would anyone like to add a little bit, bit more to that? I think it's an interesting one. I, I know certainly the um, divestment argument has, has um, been very much supported by the church. And although it may seem odd, the, the sort of belief values that people have are still governed by who who supports them and who doesn't. So if some of the big banks, if some of the big organizations then turn around and say, well, I'm sorry, but you're investing in whoever it happens to be and we're not happy with it, it will make a difference. We have got the opportunity to, to influence that, but I've, I've just recently asked the question of my own pension pot and um, it was explained to me that it's not that easy. Um, you know, we've, we've chosen the companies we're going to invest in and again, if you're pulling millions out of a, a pension fund um, from one organisation to another, there is now the, the legal issue of failure to, to comply with contracts and, and all sorts of things. So I can understand that it, it gets more and more difficult the more questions that are asked, but it's worth trying. It's um, one of the things we're hoping to do is on the, in the, the upcoming election to have a green hustings to actually ask a specific question of each of the um, potential parties in the city to see what they're going to do on climate change. Just to ask the question is probably the best way of doing it. Definitely. Thanks so much, Jackie. Thank you, Matthew, for your question. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much to Elizabeth Cavanagh. Uh, Jackie Young and Dr. Robbie Jones, thank you so much for taking your time out to speak to us this afternoon. Um, just like to remind you of our next webinar, please sign up on our website, futureplymouth2030.co.uk. It'll be on behaviour change again, but this time focusing on education. It's on March the 24th at 4pm. Um, I hope you have a wonderful evening and the rest of the week, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Tim. Thanks.